if our egocentrism gives way to altruism, we would have already attained Buddhahood. We would undoubtedly achieve all the benefits for ourselves and others perfectly. If we replace our self-centeredness with benefiting others and replace our self-cherishing with loving others, we would have already attained Buddhahood. We could perfectly achieve the benefits for ourselves and all sentient beings. This is because all Buddhas and Buddhasattvas awaken themselves and others in this way, ultimately attaining a perfect enlightenment. Now, we need to awaken ourselves. With the help and guidance from your spiritual teacher and the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas throughout countless kalpas, you finally awaken a little bit. At this point, you should start to learn to awaken others. After awakening, you should work for the benefit of others to achieve perfect enlightenment. This requires awakening others. If you help all sentient beings to awaken, you will attain perfect enlightenment. The attainment of perfect enlightenment requires benefiting others. I have been teaching you the Dharma daily. You should have already awakened. However, even after awakening, you haven't perfected your practice. That's why we need to awaken others. While helping others, self-grasping, self-importance and self-cherishing will gradually diminish. Otherwise, all our toil will be in vain and a waste of time. If we don't replace our self-centeredness with altruism, even if we are busy making various plans for ourselves every day, it will be in vain. Even animals toil for food. If we only work for survival and strive for a better life, aren't we fundamentally the same as animals? We would waste the precious human life we have obtained in this lifetime. We would live like this for ten days, a hundred days, and even the entire life. In this sense, no matter how busy we are, It is all in vain. Toiling for survival is what animals do. Engaging in spiritual practice to awaken oneself is also at a low level and cannot lead to Buddhahood. Of course, beginners should first awaken themselves, understand their own situation, know how to practice and overcome self-grasping. Awakening oneself means eliminating self-grasping. Awakening others means helping sentient beings eliminate self-grasping. Please focus on this task first. Don't discuss lofty topics like everything is empty from the beginning. You haven't reached that level, so it is futile to talk about it. I have noticed that some monastics are very self-centered and selfish. Nonetheless, they always dream about enlightenment and eagerly wish to attain Buddhahood. Can such selfish individuals realize the truth? No, they cannot. What can they see? Apart from self-grasping, they cannot see anything else. Self-grasping is very powerful and blocks all light of wisdom. Without uprooting self-grasping, how can you realize and develop greater wisdom? Now, we finally come to realize that our greatest enemy is self-grasping. Through such observation and contemplation, we finally realize that the primary enemy is none other than our self-grasping. Our misconceptions and clinging to ourselves are the root of all afflictions. This is the fundamental problem we need to solve through spiritual practice. 
Awakening oneself is about vanquishing self-grasping. While awakening others, helping sentient beings eliminate self-grasping, our self-grasping gradually diminishes as well. How wonderful! While benefiting others, we are also eradicating self-grasping. Typically, awakening oneself starts from dealing with self-grasping through learning, contemplation and meditation. Benefiting others, on the other hand, is about realising and embodying non-self in our daily lives. If you can interact with sentient beings selflessly, you have succeeded and become a genuine Buddha or Buddhasattva. How wonderful. I believe we can achieve this, right? As long as you aspire to do so, you can accomplish it. However, many Buddhists don't have the fortune or conditions to learn these teachings. We should help them. First, we shall guide the Buddhists who have a karmic connection with us to the right view of non-self and teach them how to practice. When you can practice non-self, you can start teaching others. While teaching others, you will unconsciously fulfill your own practice. While helping others, you may progress even faster than when you practice meditation on your own. When meditating alone, you may find it difficult. However, while helping others, you will find that self-grasping diminishes quickly. When you devote yourself to serving sentient beings, your self-grasping diminishes rapidly. Let go of yourself, benefit others selflessly, and embody the wisdom of non-self. How wonderful! As long as you have self-grasping, you will have afflictions when helping sentient beings. You might think, oh no, this affects my practice. Even though you are a practitioner, you always feel that others affect or hinder your practice. You are often unwilling to help others, considering it not beneficial for your practice. However, you are wrong. Benefiting others can eliminate self-attachment. When you let go of yourself and serve others, Aren't you exactly overcoming self-grasping? Eliminating self-grasping is your task. Ten hours of sitting meditation may not be as effective as ten minutes of serving others. Serving others selflessly for ten minutes can be even more effective than practicing meditation for a month. Even if you meditate for a month, your self-grasping may remain ingrained. We can meditate on non-self in the morning or evening and help sentient beings during the day. I believe this approach can lead to faster progress. Meditate on non-self and cultivate compassion in the morning and evening. Implement what you have cultivated during the day. Serve sentient beings wholeheartedly and undertake the Buddha's mission. Of course, when we encounter obstacles or sense that afflictions are about to arise during the day, we should quickly engage in meditation. Activate mindfulness and then proceed with your tasks. When mindfulness is absent, you have to watch yourself. If your self-grasping is ingrained during meditation, or if your afflictions arise when you work for the benefit of sentient beings, it indicates that your self-grasping has resurfaced. When self-grasping arises, you are no longer in a state of mindfulness. At that time, you should pause what you are doing and engage in meditation. After the meditation session, you should immediately implement what you have cultivated and continue your work. 
In this way, you will make swift progress. Therefore, eliminating self-grasping is the most crucial focus of spiritual practice. With mindfulness and introspection, we should strive to avoid the attachment that hasn't arisen and prevent the attachment that has already arisen from continuing. Introspection is about meditating on non-self and generating the mindfulness of non-self. Then, we should constantly be mindful of the harms of self-grasping and self-cherishing and prevent attachment from arising. If any attachment has arisen, we shall watch it with wisdom to protect the mind from being trapped in the continuity of attachment. I have explained it clearly, but many people still don't practice it. We should focus on cultivating this aspect. That's why monastics are fortunate. They can dedicate themselves to overcoming self-grasping for a long time, preventing the mind from being trapped in the continuity of attachment. Otherwise, the mind will be caught up in delusions and carried away by them, shaping our mental continuum that continues to influence future lives. If self-grasping constantly arises in your mental continuum without interruption, you will undergo reincarnation and remain trapped in the cycle of samsara. We must never fall back into the cycle of samsara. We need to be mindful of non-self constantly. In our daily lives, we should meditate on non-self from morning till night, even during sleep. Before reciting mantras or cultivating bodhicitta, we should be mindful of non-self. This is fundamental. By contemplating non-self, your self-grasping will diminish significantly. When you realize that the five aggregates are not self, your mind truly enters a selfless state. After that, when you recite mantras or cultivate bodhicitta, it will produce different results. Self-grasping is deeply ingrained, so we need to counteract it repeatedly. Self-grasping arises from habituation since beginningless time and is deeply ingrained. We need to engage in this practice many times and observe it repeatedly. It's not just a matter of practicing multiple times. We need to practice it millions of times. Through repeated practice, we will gradually realize that every thought and even the entire world are illusions that arise from causes and conditions. They arise and cease due to causes and conditions. Every thought has its causes and conditions. No thought arises without reason. Even the entire world is a product of causes and conditions. We should repeatedly contemplate the great merits of benefiting others, thus generating a courageous determination. Benefiting sentient beings is extraordinary in two aspects, eliminating self-grasping and achieving great compassion of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. While benefiting others, you can practice exchanging yourself and others. If you constantly think of benefiting sentient beings, your self-grasping will dissolve. They are two main aspects of Buddhasattva practice. Therefore, benefiting sentient beings is significant. Of course, while helping sentient beings, we should not be too attached. We should not perceive them as real sentient beings. After realizing non-self, you will discover that sentient beings too are devoid of self. We guide them because their mental continuum is clouded by ignorance and we are helping them break free from ignorance. 
Sentient beings are also illusions arising from causes and conditions. All sentient beings arise and cease due to causes and conditions. There are no real sentient beings. Sentient beings arise and cease due to causes and conditions. They are just bound by self-grasping. Self-grasping, however, is also a product of dependent arising. Hence, we can uproot it. Self-grasping does not exist from the beginning. It arises from ignorance. Initially, there is no attachment to self in person. After beginningless ignorance arises, the attachments to self in phenomenon and self in person gradually emerge. If the thought of disregarding sentient beings has not arisen, do not let it arise. If it has already arisen, do not let it continue. If the thought of neglecting sentient beings hasn't arisen, you should prevent it from arising. If it has already arisen, you should immediately counteract it with compassion and prevent it from continuing. Disregarding sentient beings is an inherent habit of ordinary beings. However, when we recognize the harms of self-grasping and the merits of benefiting others, we should change this mindset, transforming abandonment into care and indifference into compassion. Disregarding sentient beings, such as being indifferent, selfish and lacking compassion, is not what we should do. How can we cultivate the mindset of cherishing and caring for others? We can do so by extending the same love and care to sentient beings as we do to ourselves. How can we cultivate the attitude of cherishing and caring for others? Is there a way to generate such a mindset? It is to treat all sentient beings with the same care and love we have for ourselves. This love and care is the foundation of compassion. Some abnormal individuals even hate themselves. Because they hate themselves, they harbour stronger anger toward others. Hating oneself is actually a distorted form of self-cherishing. In reality, they love themselves. Because they love themselves too much, it brings them much suffering. Consequently, they feel overwhelmed by their suffering and end up hating themselves. This is even more terrible. Lama Atisha said, Only the Tibetans know what it means to be a Bodhisattva who doesn't understand how to cultivate compassion. It is said that when Lama Atisha arrived in Tibet, he asked the local monastics how to cultivate Bodhicitta. They replied, just practice according to the ritual. Upon hearing this, Lama Atisha sighed, saying, Only the Tibetans know what it means to be a Bodhisattva who doesn't understand how to cultivate compassion. The situation is similar in the Chinese Buddhist circle. Many Buddhists have received the Bodhisattva vows, but how many of them know how to generate Bodhicitta and cultivate compassion? We should understand that the essence of the Bodhisattva vows is Bodhicitta and the Bodhisattva practice. If one doesn't know how to generate Bodhicitta and cultivate compassion, they are merely Bodhisattvas in name, but not in reality. This is a sad phenomenon. Although Chinese Buddhism belongs to the Mahayana tradition, it hasn't given sufficient emphasis to the teachings on Bodhicitta. As a result, many people who study Mahayana teachings only generate an aspiration for individual liberation. That is why the Chan tradition in China has become lost. Originally, Chan was the essence of Mahayana Buddhism. 
However, many people pursue enlightenment without generating bodhicitta. In reality, they seek personal liberation. With such a Hinayana mindset, how can they attain enlightenment? That would be impossible. With a Hinayana mindset, at most, one can comprehend the principle of non-self, which is also for their own sake. They may think, as long as I realize non-self and attain liberation, it's enough. I don't care if sentient beings attain liberation or not. I will benefit them according to the circumstances. After I have fulfilled my duties, I will enter nirvana. This is the way of some arhats. After attaining arhatship, they won't end their lives or enter nirvana immediately. They will continue to help sentient beings according to the circumstances. However, when it's time for them to enter nirvana, they will enter nirvana. They haven't vowed to benefit sentient beings. Although they don't have self-attachment, they don't have the aspiration to benefit sentient beings either. Such arhats are rare. It is not easy to become this kind of arhat because it is hard to uproot self-attachment without benefiting others. Therefore, with such a mindset, it is also hard to attain arhatship. So, how should we cultivate compassion? Lama Atisha said we should start from the preliminary practices and follow the stages. So, how should we cultivate compassion? The answer given by Lama Atisha is to start by following the stages of the preliminary practices. In other words, we should start by contemplating the impermanence of life, taking refuge in the three jewels, firmly believing in the law of causality, cultivating renunciation, etc., progressing step by step. In this sense, the teaching on bodhicitta encompasses not just the seven steps of cause and effect meditation to generate bodhicitta and exchanging self and others. It contains the complete journey from entering the Buddhist path to attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, to cultivate bodhicitta, we should begin by meditating on the impermanence of life and the three types of suffering, firmly believing in the law of causality, etc. In other words, we should start by cultivating renunciation. Without a qualified renunciation, one cannot cultivate bodhicitta. It is necessary to progress step by step. This is the answer given by Lama Atisha. Lama Atisha's answer is very accurate and it also aligns with our teachings. I hope you can start cultivating Buddhacitta by contemplating the impermanence of life. In the words of my perfect teacher, Buddhacitta is the key. If you cultivate Buddhacitta well, you will attain spiritual accomplishments. You are very fortunate. I have taught clearly. As long as you put the teachings into practice, you can achieve enlightenment. However, if you don't practice such great teachings, there is no other way. All right, we'll conclude here for today.